Good morning. Welcome to the United Methodist Church of Westchester. Thank you so much for coming today to worship. We hope you find Christ alive here and the people beside you very warm and welcoming and friendly. And I know many of you have come to pray for the Eagles, so hard and fast for Nick Foles at all. Okay. Um, there are a few announcements I'd like to bring forward this morning. Most of them are in the box. So notice that our soup sale begins today. That's going to be coming at the end of February. But you can sign up now for these many different kinds of soup. And all of the proceeds go towards United Methodist Women's uh, mission projects around the area and around the globe. So I hope you can take part in that. Secondly, to mention that we do have another spring musical coming up. And so if you have any third through sixth graders in your family, Think about signing them up, getting them on board, get them pumped for that. It's wonderful to have as many kids as possible as part of the spring musical, which will be presented on Mother's Day. Molly D has a couple of announcements for us this morning. So I would uh, like to report that we packaged 35,856 meals on Monday for Rise Against Hunger. Thank you all very much. And uh, very soon our fundraising efforts for 2019 will begin. <laughs> so when you see something about Rise Against Hunger, um, please um, support us. Uh, the second thing I would like to mention is the um, Prison Pillow Project, which you'll see on your announcement page. We've had some response from a couple of people. We still need a few more people. We need people next Sunday afternoon at 1230 to um, go to Grove to help prepare the pillows for um, taking them to the prison to be um, finished off, to be made. So um, that's January the 28th at 1230 out at Grove United Methodist Church. And then we also need a couple of people that are willing to go um, to the prison and work with the women there to assemble the pillows. I do not have the date. My understanding is it's the, in the last two weeks of February on a weekday night. As soon as I know, we'll get the information out there. But if you're interested, please see me um, today. And then on March the 11th, our youth, um, along with other youth in the Mission Connection, will be delivering the pillows to Brandywine Hall. So that'll be a really, um, a really good thing. And I didn't know if you were going to speak to this. Yeah. Because I want to stay near the microphone to defend myself. Oh, okay. Uh, last night, once again, our, um, you know, there was a quizzo night to raise funds for Act in Faith. It was uh, actually the most successful one yet. And once again, the Methodist table won the prize. Um, we got some smart Methodists. We had two tables, and I was part of the winning table the first two years, and okay. I thought, boy, I'm pretty smart. This year I was at the other table. I'm not so smart. <laughs> <laughs> All depends who you surround yourself with, you know. But at Molly D's table, just to mention, they had a shocking experience when a question came yes. up about Walt Disney, and Molly D did not know it. Yeah, I know. I, I know. Sharon but that, in my you. defense, I was at the winning table. Yeah. <laughs> so I came home with yes, the balloon. She was. Yes, she was. <laughs> Very good. Um, finally, everybody be really quiet for a minute and listen. What do you hear? That's the sound of our organ ready to take off in flight, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. We are getting a new organ at just the right time, my brothers and sisters, okay? Uh, basically, last Sunday, uh, leadership in our church signed the contract, put a check in the hands of Rogers Organs, and uh, I guess we're starting right off with it's going to take a few months for them to build a new console for us. It's being built somewhere on the other side of the country. The Rogers Organs is a local uh, company, and basically, you can look forward to on April the 9th, uh, that's when they're going to come in and start their work. So that's April the 9th. So for these next couple months, there's going to be all kinds of honking and wheezing coming out of this. But this is not the end of the story, okay? Let's prepare to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth.
please stand and join me in the call to worship. Wondrous and gracious God, we are waiting and hoping. We are your people, called by you to live and serve and love. may be seated. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Come, therefore, let us confess the ways we have acted without integrity. Let us confess and be true to ourselves in God, so that we may know ourselves forgiven. And now let us confess our sins first corporately together and then alone in silence. Lord, we have been a and one another and have not always spoken the truth. We have sinned in our anger. We have not worked honestly, and we have not always shared with the needy. Evil talk has come out of our mouths, and our words have not given grace to those who hear. We have grieved the Holy Spirit because we have not imitated God and have we lived in love. Sacrifice has not been part of our lifestyle. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to love your people 
and not to be complacent about our gifts. Help us to be honest through and through so that we may praise you with our whole being. And now please join me in the words of assurance. The God of love, who formed us intimately in our mother's womb, knows all the workings of our hearts. Know that you have been forgiven in Christ and become whole. And now let us rise and greet each other with signs of peace and unity. If you feel that you didn't get to say hello to enough people, remember the gathering area following the service. Please come and uh, greet everyone. Let us affirm our faith together. We affirm that we are created in God's image, befriended by Christ, and indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We celebrate God's goodness that is embedded in all creation and God's promise to redeem that creation. We trust that God is always at work in us and in this world at all times, in all places, in all people. We serve you by serving others, seeking to lift up the fallen, bind up the wounds, give control to those who mourn, and to be your presence as a light in the darkness. We believe that God continues to speak, continues to call, continues to draw us into God's life. We rejoice in the church's invitation to participate in the unfolding purposes of God. We hope in God's sure and certain reign as we begin to live that future reality now. Amen.
now hear the prayer for illumination. Jesus, teach us to have hope that we can live in peace and unity with each other, even though we may not think alike. May we, may we love alike. God, help us to see the dignity in each other as we are each a unique and wonderful creation created in your image. Give us joy to see the other do well. And teach us, Lord, through the scriptures, your sacrificial love that we might give of ourselves, especially for the marginalized. Teach us through your, your words in scripture, God. Amen. From Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one of mine. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not at your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we begin a sermon series called, What Will We Do Now? What Will You Do Now? The now is now that you are a Christian, now that you are a member of this church, the United Methodist Church of Westchester. The series is loosely based on a series by Rick Warren, who's the pastor of that huge and influential Saddleback Church in Southern California. His series is focused on what the expectations of membership are at Saddleback. Our series focuses on living a committed Christian life. How do you live out your Christian commitment? What are the most important things in life as a Christian that you should put first, that you should fashion the rest of your week around? We're doing this series now because we live in an age where commitments, deep commitments, lifelong commitments seem to be falling away. We have become a distracted people, such a busy people. Our lives are overfilled with football and soccer, travel and work, recreation of all kinds, nonstop distractions on our cell phones and 24-hour news cycles. If we don't intentionally and habitually set aside a time for God, for worshiping and serving Jesus, for studying the word and breathing in the spirit through prayer, we will drown in an ocean of unimportant, time-wasting things. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Don't lose yourself. Don't lose your soul. It's January, the time of the year to take on new commitments, the time of the year to get in shape. So let's get our church in shape. Let's get your life in shape. I hope you can be here for the next few weeks here in January into that first week of February or so. Uh, each week you'll see the membership expectations that we share with each new members class right there in our bulletin. Each week you'll see some quotes from Wesley and from others. Maybe you'll see some tips on how to live out a, a certain commitment in your life. We'll be creative each week, doing things a little differently each week. Commit yourself to simply being here in worship. And let's see what God will do with us together. Now, together is what we're focusing on today. The importance of being together as a community, living together in a way that builds each other up, growing together in peace and in joy. From the moment the church was born, it was a sanctuary. A sanctuary, a holy, sacred, protected place. A place very different from the rest of the world. The world was the place where people deceived and devoured and mistreated, where people broke each other down. The church is the place where the truth is sought after and honored, where love was applied to hurting souls, where people came to be built up, where a whole new family was born. People speaking against each other, hurting each other's feelings, living in, in ways that let the family down, these things happened from the very beginning, okay? 
The church was human from the very beginning. It's still absolutely human today. So Paul had to speak out again and again to church after church, encouraging them, directing them, sometimes chiding them and, re and rebuking them so that they would live a life worthy of the gospel, a life worthy of what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul gives us the first building block and by far the most important building block of creating a solid, unified church. The first building block of unity. Paul says, put aside your selfishness, your selfish ambitions. Stop being so conceited, thinking that you are the only one who knows the truth. You are not. Only Jesus knows the truth in all its height and depth and breadth. Get to know the mind of Jesus and let that same mind be in all of us together. And be humble. Think of others first, he says. Think of others as better than yourself. Care for their interests, too. That's what Jesus did. He thought about your interests first when he went to the cross. And if we do this, we will find consoling love and compassion and sympathy. The Spirit will guide us and we'll experience a joy like we cannot get anywhere else. It all starts with humility. With humility. In an age when we shout at one another to get our way, and the one who shouts the loudest usually wins. Humility is a counter-cultural concept. It must be taught, it must be learned, it must be practiced for it to exist. You will stand out if you strive to be a more humble person. Frederick Buechner says, true humility doesn't consist of thinking ill of yourself, but of not thinking of yourself much differently than the way you think of everybody else around you. you know? Just saying you're one of many. You belong with everybody. Humility isn't something you can simply decide to receive. I, I'm convinced of that. It develops inside of us as we meditate on God, as we meditate on the Creator and our small place in this vast creation. Humility is etched in our hearts as we come to grips with Jesus' crucifixion, how he died for us, for our sins, how he died for you, for your sins. Yes, you are a sinful and broken person. You are not as bright as you think you are. You are not as good as you think you are. Christ died for you because you needed it, because we needed it. Me too. Everybody else in here too. Let's take a moment to silently pray, to remember Jesus and all that he has done for you and me, for us. To ask for the gift of humility. Without humility, there can be no real unity in this church or in this world. Let's pray. Amen. At this time, our uh, ushers will be passing out the friendship folders. Please fill them out. Let us know that you've been here. If you have any questions or comments, you can write them right on there. Make sure you notice the names of the visitors around you, beside you, and get a chance to greet one another by name and build up community in that fashion. There's also a prayer card in there. Please use it if you have a special prayer request for our, our church prayer group. Um, and at this time, could we also have our children come forward for our message for growing Christians? This morning, it's being led by our own super teacher, Barb Williamson. Yeah, yeah very good. morning. How's everybody doing today? The snow all went away. Are you sad? Kind of. Yeah, me too. I think we'll get some more. So, let's see what I've got to do.
Okay, is that, oh, that's so much better. You guys can hear me now. So who's feeling strong today? Are you? Okay, okay. So here's a stick. Oh, wait, can you break this stick for me, do you think? Use two hands. Use two hands. Break it. Good. Wow, you are so strong. All right. Now, let's see who's strong. All right, come on, Jilly. All right, so now Jilly's going to try to break this bundle of sticks. Come on up. Two hands. Oh, come on, muscles. Oh, well, she might do it, actually. Okay. All right. Uh, what? So what do you think? All right, thank you, Jilly. She had her, she had her Wheaties today. Hmm. So what's the difference between the stick, the one stick, and all these sticks together? Isn't this bundle just made up of all those same sticks that we had? And that was so easy to break. How come these aren't so easy to break? They're a bundle. And they're all what? All together, right? Kate, what are we going to say? Oh, yeah, one little piece fell off. That's right. All right, well, this sticks in a bundle, and guess what? The sticks are kind of like people, all right? So when people are by themselves, they can do a lot of pretty good things, right? But when all the people get together, were any of you here on Monday packing meals? So what happens when all those people come together? What happens, Jilly? Yeah, they work together and they do it. That's right. So like these sticks, they teach us a really good lesson about our church. And sometimes we might think that church, oh, we don't really, sometimes we don't need to go to church because we can, we can kind of think about God and Jesus and pray on our own. But guess what happens when we all come together in church? What do you think happens? You think God hears our prayers even better then? Yes, he does. That's right, because we're all praying with him and learning about him all together. So when we stand together with other people that are following Jesus, they might help us and encourage us, because sometimes things don't really go our way, right? Do you ever have a bad day? Yeah? And when you are by yourself and you're having a bad day, you feel kind of sad, right? What happens when then you share something that's not so bad and you share it with other people? How do those other people help make you feel? What do you think? A little bit better. That's right. So when we come to church, that's our way of having all those people around us like this bundle of sticks. And they make us feel really strong all together, bundled together. All right, boys and girls, let's bow our heads and say a prayer. Father, when we're tempted to do things we know are wrong, we're going to try to remember the lesson of those sticks, that there's strength in coming together as one, just like this bundle of sticks. Protect us and help us to be the one, to be one with other believers, just as you are one with Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, boys and girls. And you're going to go to Splash or Children's Church or back with Mom and Dad.
dwell with each other in peace, glistening like morning dew sweet on the hills, one in unity. Lord, hear our prayer. Great God of mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Oh, send us your word. That all may be one, that all may be one in you. As children of your grace, seeking your presence, we stand now before you. Teach us compassion and show us the Our second reading today is from the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 15 and 19. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of, of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual edification. Here is Amen. the reading of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a wonderful choir or what? Oh my gosh. Wow. It's beautiful. And Mike just picks the perfect anthems for the perfect moments on the right days. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Now years ago there was a comic strip. I was in the paper that went something like this. It was a man speaking on the telephone. You can only hear his side of the conversation. Yes, mother, I've had a hard day. Yeah, Gladys has been very difficult. I know I ought to be more firm, but, but it's hard. Well, you know how she is. Uh, yeah, I remember you warned me. I remember you told me she was a selfish person who would make my life miserable. I remember you begged me not to marry her. You were right. I know. Uh, what, you want to talk to her? Good. All right, that's fine. Hey, Gladys, your mother wants to talk to you. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. None of us likes to have someone criticize us. None of us. But especially it hurts when somebody in our own family criticizes us like that, right? St. Paul saw it happening in his family, in his church. Christianity was taken in inheritance in a very rapid fashion. Some of these new believers came from the ranks of Orthodox Jews, so they were very strict in their belief of the scriptures. But many of them, particularly those who came through Paul's ministry, uh, were pagan Gentiles. Just like in a marriage, new converts brought into the Christian family their own traditions, their own values from their backgrounds, their own preferences, and sometimes, actually a lot of times, the Apostle Paul had to play referee. He was a referee for his churches. Some of the new believers were attached to the Jewish Sabbath. Others sincerely believed that all days were holy and one day should not be lifted up among the others. 
Some followers fasted, others saw that there was no need to fast, some were meat eaters and some were vegetarians. The disagreements within the church were many, but worse than that, the disagreements quickly became personal for a lot of people. People were passing judgment on one another um, when they did not follow the customs that they themselves followed. The church was becoming divided. So Paul felt obligated to say something about that. He wanted them to stop it. The church was big enough, he said, for all different kinds of opinions. The important thing is that whatever your beliefs are, your lives are to give glory to God. Out of this conflict within the church comes our lesson from Paul's letter to the Romans today. Now the immediate conflict was about eating meat offered to idols. I guess you kind of remember that, right? That whole situation. Some people thought that it was wise and wonderful to eat because they knew that there were no such things as idols, that there was only one God and those little statues that were in their neighbors' homes right before their food there, you know, when their neighbors would invite them over to dinner, those statues meant nothing, okay? And their prayers really didn't matter because there was only one God. So they said, we can eat this meat. That's no problem at all. <laughs> Others thought, that they were the only faithful ones in the church because they refused to eat meat with their neighbors, which were offered to their neighbors' gods before serving. They refused on principle, and they were biblically correct in their own minds, and they, that's what they told everybody. You know what Paul said? Who cares? <laughs> he basically said, who cares? Who really cares? Eating meat, not eating meat, who cares? Let nothing divide you, he said. The kingdom of God is not about small stuff like eating a piece of meat. The church is big enough to have meat eaters and meat refusers sitting side by side. Uh, look up, see a broader picture, he says, of the kingdom of God. And it's not about food and drink. It's about living a righteous life, a good life, about living in peace with your neighbor, about enjoying the Holy Spirit, not being bitter and not being contentious. Anyone who serves Christ is acceptable to God, Paul clearly says. Anyone who wants to serve Christ, anyone, no matter what your opinions are, no matter what your lifestyles are, anyone, build your brothers and sisters up, he said. Stop judging one another. That's another building block of community. Stop judging. First, be humble. Second, be non-judgmental. A non-judgmental stance towards others means that you're assuming the best motives and intentions of one another, assuming that nobody is really going out of their way to hurt you. This is essential if we're going to live together in peace. If we're going to make this church a true sanctuary where people feel safe to speak their minds. We are non-judgmental because now is not the time to judge, number one, and number two, because it is not our place to judge. Judgment will come for all of us. It's coming at the end of time for every one of us. That is the truth. And all other judgments don't matter. And Jesus, we know, will be the final judge, sorting through all of those times that we let God down, and those times that we hurt one another, and those times when we refuse to help others. And Jesus will say again and again, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. After running a picture of uh, the United States Senators taking the oath of office, this was a little while ago, there was a picture in the paper of the, of the United States Senators taking office. One local newspaper received a critical and sarcastic letter. And the writer of that letter complained, the senator from Hawaii does not know his right hand from his left. Senator Inouye of Hawaii took the oath with his left hand in this picture and not with his right hand. But there was something in the picture uh, in the newspaper that was not shown. And the, the critical writer did not know anything about it. You see, after Pearl Harbor happened on December 7, 1941, Daniel Inouye joined the Army. He fought in Italy. He won the Distinguished Service Cross and the Bronze Star and a Purple Heart with clusters. When he took oath, his oath of office as a senator, he did it with his left hand raised because his right hand he lost in service to his country. We could save ourselves a lot of embarrassment if we knew all the facts before we judged someone else. And you want to know the little secret? None of us know all the facts. None of us know all the facts about one another. Only God knows the deepest facts and the broadest facts about each other. And so I ask you to take a moment once again to meditate on a time when you made a judgment of one another. We've all done this. Maybe you did something in the last day. Maybe you did something in the last 10 minutes. I don't know. But 
Take a moment to meditate on a time you made a judgment of another person based on an assumption, and you were wrong. You were wrong. Ask God's forgiveness and ask for the character and the courage to not be so judgmental with others in the future. Let us pray. Amen. us from the book of Ephesians. See what God might be saying to you in these words. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen. Very good. Now, our third part today of the sermon or the message is going to be short and sweet. It's going to begin with a little exercise, a little physical exercise. So I ask you all to please stand up. Please stand up. Very good. Please stand up. Good. Now, all of you, would you please turn around so you face the back of the church? Just turn around so you face the back of the church. You guys turn around so you face the front of the church. Turn around. That's good. Excellent. Okay. Good. Now, complete the circle and turn all the way around the other way and face me again. Turn around, face me again. Very good. Okay. Now, can you put your right hand on top of your head and your right hand, rub your belly and pat like this. Oh, no. You guys look so silly. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Sit on down. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have just experienced the power of words. <laughs> the power of words. Words have tremendous power. They change things. They move people. I just made a whole room full of people stand up, turn around, and sit down. I could have made you do the hokey pokey. <laughs> would have done it just because of my words, okay? Let's not underestimate the power of words. They change things every single time they come out of our mouth. They can make things happen. They can be bullets which penetrate the heart if you want them to, wounding those whom you have intended, or they can bring great joy and great celebration and great healing. Consider the difference between just these two statements, two, three little sentences, two, three word sentences. I love you. How does that make you feel when you hear that? When somebody you really care about, it makes you feel a lot, right? I love you. Now, how about if that same person said to you, I hate you? Three words, all short. Extremely powerful. Words can wound and words can heal. In this place, in this place, commit yourself to using healing words. Practice using healing words here so that you can use more and more of them out there, where out there words are used to divide and to slice people up and to manipulate one another. That's what we're going to learn out there in here learn loving, kind, healing words. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus because they were tearing each other apart with their words. You can't have a unified church if everybody is gossiping or talking badly about each other behind their backs when there's any kind of, of critical, crucial decision. Paul says to them, be truthful. Be truthful, which means seek out the truth, the whole truth, and then speak only that. We are part of each other's lives, he said. We are members of one another. Yes, we will make each other angry sometimes. It happened from the very beginning of the church. It's going to happen here, too. It's going to happen for all time until the kingdom of God comes and we're all resurrected and holy and wonderful. But he says, you can be angry, just don't sin. Be angry, but sin not. Do not be destructive with one another. Work things out, he says, as quickly as possible. Before the sun goes down, if possible, he says, don't let evil talk come out of your mouth. It makes God sad when you do it. You see what it says in the scripture? It grieves the Holy Spirit. It makes God sad. When you say bad words about one another, lay aside bitterness and wrath and anger and slander. Be kind to one another, it says. Forgive one another. Have a tender heart for the broken things in our community. God in Christ was tender towards you. God has forgiven you. Mother Teresa has a wonderful quote. And if, the, if you don't remember anything from this little three-part sermon, okay, remember this quote from Mother Teresa. She said, let no one come to you without going away better and happier. Let no one come to you without going away better and happier. Each one of us has the power to use words and language that provide a means of grace to those who hear them. We have the ability to inspire, aim for this, work on this, do far more building up than tearing down with your words. I have a little family exercise for you to do as you go home today. It's very simple. You can remember this, okay? Just want you to go around your family who's ever there. You know, maybe it's just a spouse, maybe it's more. And just ask if they can remember three times when they received a compliment in their family, in your family. Three times when a compliment was shared to each member of your family. Three compliments. If you can't recall any you need to do work. 
and using more healing words. We should be doing far more compliments than words that hurt one another. It reminds me of the story of a guy who was sprawled out in front of the television with popcorn in his hand and with uh, empty cans all around him, and his wife decides to walk in front of the screen and say, you've got to tell me right now, do you love me more than football? Do you love me more than football? And there was a thoughtful silence for a while. And then he said, well, honey, I love you more than hockey. <laughs> Each one of us needs even a little assurance, you know, of love and comfort again and again and again. Such language is healing. It builds bridges of understanding and loyalty. It creates an environment of gentleness and patience. If we are critical people, we will live in a critical place. If we are complementary people, we will live in a community filled with compliments. Healing words are building blocks of unity. Let us pray. Oh God, we seek the impossible today. We seek an impossible unity to be formed among us and to be formed around us in our world. And so we ask, oh God, you would move in our hearts to make us yours, make us humble, make us whole and complete. We ask that you would move in our thoughts and in our judgments, that they would always be kind and merciful, and they would be used in a way that builds up relationships with others. And we ask, O oh God, that you would move in our mouths the hardest things that we ever have to tame in our lives, our tongues, that our words would be good and pure and loving and would build bridges with one another. We pray for those on our prayer list and those on our long-term prayer list. They're going through very difficult days, and we ask, O oh God, that you would take their difficult days and help them to roll into all of their days bring integrity to all those who suffer, to all of us in our times of suffering, that we can remember the good with the bad. We can remember that you are there at all times and in all places. Bring healing, bring wholeness, bring growth to those on our prayer list and long-term prayer list. And especially, O oh God, bring many angels along their path, people with kind words and good deeds and with acts of true self-sacrificing love. We pray, O oh God, for our church. Make us a sanctuary for people in a very broken world. To the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray as a family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's bring before the Lord our God our morning tithes and offerings.
church be led by your spirit. Amen. with God and learn a life of love. Jesus didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Amen. Go in peace.